Open your Bibles today to Nehemiah, book of Nehemiah. <clears throat> We're looking at leadership. Essentials of uh, Christian leadership. We had an opportunity last week to spend a few moments talking about delegation. Delegation out of uh, the book of Exodus, chapter 18. That your middle initial should be D for Mr. Delegation. Your job is to make sure the job gets done. It'll be done by putting people to work. Now, part of the um, art of leadership is what we're talking about this, uh, this afternoon. is the issue of motivation. Your basic task as a leader is to not only uh, equip people for ministry, assign them tasks, but thereafter to be the prime motivator. Motivator to get people motivated, keep them at the task, uh, keep them focused. One of the great books on leadership that you'll discover is the book of Nehemiah. It's a wonderful, wonderful booklet that uh, God has given us. Uh, many, many truths involved in that. But it's a classic example of a man that God chose, God used to lead the people of Israel in the rebuilding of the, of the walls of Jerusalem. A phenomenal, a phenomenal task that was assigned to him by God. And he was able to take a discouraged lot of people there in Israel, really discouraged, downcast, uh, disorganized, and uh, get him motivated. came from uh, imprisonment and made his journey, and God uh, sovereignly uh, used him in a way to motivate his people, get his people organized so that they accomplish the job in a short period of time. So again, it's a classic book on leadership. And I wanted us to, this afternoon, take uh, Nehemiah and the first few chapters and glean there uh, from the book of Nehemiah key principles on how to be a motivator of people. How to be a motivator of people. Uh, you can always spot a leader because he always has a following always has a following. If you claim to be a leader, but nobody's following, you're not. You're a hobo. Okay? You're, you're, a, you're, a, you're not a leader. A leader always has a following, and he's always motivating that following to keep that following encouraged, keep them um, on task, keep them on track. So we... Uh, would like to then look at Nehemiah as a classic example of a man who was a prime motivator. Now, we spoke about this uh, many, many weeks ago, that as a, as a leader, as a, an individual, your primary responsibility is to keep numero uno motivated. And who's numero uno? You. Get, keep yourself motivated. Get yourself out of bed. Get yourself dressed. Get yourself in your car and get yourself focused in the office or wherever God's taking you. And that is going to be your biggest challenge, to do that week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, and to stay to the task. And that is, that's your biggest, your biggest challenge is going to be you, you and how to keep yourself motivated. Now once you get out of that one, the next biggest challenge is how to take, keep your people motivated, how to take every single body that's working with you involved in ministry how to keep them motivated. So I think if you take these principles out of Nehemiah, put them into your life, into your, into your, into your nature of uh, leading, and uh, make them second nature to you, it'll make leadership you know, easier for you because you'll always be thinking of intuitively motivating other people. It'll always be, it'll always be just part of your nature, not, not kind of be moving, it's almost like a, um, a good sheepdog, you know? It's already in him. To get around and start rounding up the sheep and just moving them along. It just becomes second nature to you. And same way you as a shepherd will have this thing involved. You'll be involved just as a second nature. So uh, not having time to read every, every chapter in Nehemiah, let me just um, isolate and identify some of the key movements in the first few chapters from Nehemiah in regards to how he motivated people. Number one, from chapters 1 through chapter 1 and verse 1 to chapter 2 and verse 3, what you find here is Nehemiah's heart. Nehemiah's heart, when he finds out about the people of Israel, they came in and told him how the, na the city was destroyed, the walls had fallen apart, and the city was in great ruin because of what had happened, because of their sin. If you read through Nehemiah, you'll find um, here a broken man. 
You find a broken man. You find a man that is just overwhelmed by the people. And um, I guess you get the sense of it in chapter 2. In chapter 2, when it says, And it came about in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of, of King Artaxerxes, that wine was before him, and I took up the, up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. Now he had been sad, but not in his presence. It was death to be sad in the presence of a king. So the king said to me, Why is your face sad, though you are not sick? There is nothing but sadness of heart. Then I was very much afraid. And I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies desolate and its gates have been consumed by fire? And he expressed a key trait, a key trait in motivation of other people. And that is, we need to, you need to feel deeply, to feel deeply with the sense of mission and purpose and state of the people you're trying to lead. And so the issue is there's empathy, empathy to feel the same as they feel. You cannot be distant, you cannot be dislocated, you got to feel as they feel. And so what, what you find throughout the book of Nehemiah is the man who has made their problems his problems. Okay. You've, he's made their problems his problems. Uh, so it's not a vocation for him, you see it's not a job. You know, it's not something he's doing just because he needs the bucks or he needs the accolades. No, he's doing it because he really feels what the people feel. And that is a key ingredient in the motivation of other people. You always sense that. They motivate because they have deep, deep empathy. General Eisenhower, or General MacArthur, was a great leader of men. And uh, it was said that one night when they were invading the islands in the South Pacific. You know, they used to go and invade the islands and they practiced the island of, practice of jumping over islands to tr develop bases to get closer and closer to Japan. One night he was wide awake and he was out there pacing in front of his tent and one of the, his subordinates asked him, so General, what's the problem? He says, well, I'm, I just couldn't sleep. I've been thinking of all of our men that'll die tomorrow. I've been thinking of all of our men that'll die tomorrow. Great empathy, he said. Yeah, the, uh, because you you knew that when you landed on the beach, you would have thousands of casualties. It was just, it was just a thing. It was there's no way to avoid that. There's a great leader of men who never lost this sense of identifying with the particular sorrows and problems and difficulties of of those that were under him. You'll die for a man like that. See? You're willing to go the limit for a man like that because you know he feels the way you feel. It's important for us to note that. And so here's a man that, that had empathy. And so as you think about leading your people, even as you're leading now, do you feel what they feel? Can you identify with their struggles? Can you identify with their work? Can you identify with what they're going through? Does it make you sad? Yeah. Sad people, do they affect, do they affect the way you cannot, you cannot have your emotions not affected by your people? important for you to note that and, and it becomes it, you can express it you can you can see it on your countenance like they do they saw it in his his countenance it just bled through it was impossible for him to keep it even though it would have cost him his life had the king not been disposed towards him and liked him he could have said you know what you're out of here you know you're, you can't do that to me get out of here you're dead he could have done that to him but yet he didn't so again I want to say to us today you need to be able to cultivate the deep feeling of the lives of the people that you're going to lead. You cannot just be a distant leader that just shows up, does the stuff, and then vacates the premises. They're not going to be motivated. They're going to be motivated because of... Uh, you've heard the stories of Stonewall Jackson, the Confederate general. Too bad he was on the southern side. You know, when you're a northern sympathizer, if you're a southerner, sorry about that, but... You know, he was known for that, the great empathy with the soldiers. He uh, was a kind that f wanted to feel how they felt. If he asked them to look to go for long, long hikes, uh, he would walk. He'd walk with his troopers. If he said, let's hike all night long, we need to reach our destination next by morning. They, they walked through the rain, he'd get off his horse and walk through the rain 
He wanted to let the soldiers know that if they slept in the rain, he slept in the open with them. You know, he was shot because he was out in the front lines as a general reviewing what was taking place. And so people didn't mind dying for him. In much the same way with you, the same way. If you feel the same way about people and they know that your heart is there, they're going to follow you to the, to the limit. They're going to do whatever you do because they know that you're right there with them. And so Nehemiah, as, he be, as you begin this chapter, begin this book, you sense that about this man. Uh, here's the idea where Jesus talks about in John 10 about the hire, remember the hireling. The good shepherd, you know, feels for the sheep and he gives his life for the sheep. The hireling only wants the vessel, you know, the buck. So he's out of there. He doesn't care about the sheep. And so you and I the same way. Also, secondly, in, Mor in, in Nehemiah, what you find a second major principle here is that Nehemiah was able to motivate the people through a clear goal. As you read through chapter 2 and verse 4, through the end of chapter 2 and verse 20, you'll find the story, um, the storyline where he finally makes his way. He gets permission from the, um, from the king. And he really has a clear idea of what he wants to see, what, what he wants to see accomplished. There's no, vague, no vagueness about him. He has crystallized in his own mind what God would like him to do. And this is a great motivator when it comes to people. So you notice in, in our substructure there that he had a clear goal in his mind when the king asked him. I mean, Nehemiah told him exactly what he wanted to do. He told the king, here's what we need to do. We need, I need to go, and here are my, here are my steps. He uh, gave the steps to the king of what he wanted to do. He, um, he wasn't no idle dreamer. The man really had his act together. He had a vision what needed to be done, that we spoke about under vision. And he knew how to get the job done. He had the steps outlined, etc. And then when you come to verse 17, when he finally gets into Jerusalem, and um, he, tells, he tells the people there, listen, you see the bad situation we are in, that Jerusalem is desolate and its gates are burned by fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. I wonder how many folks in Jerusalem had that as a, as a goal. You know, many, many people, people got up and said, you know, folks, let's, we, we have one thing. We've got to rebuild these walls. I, I suppose, you know, very few ever had that. They're probably just survivalists. But see, when he got there, he knew exactly what needed to be done. Rebuild these walls. Clear goal in his mind. And, and when you add to that, when you add to that in verse 18, that somehow I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me, and also about the king's words, which he had spoken to me, as it is to say, you know, this, this thing that I have is not an idle dream. This is not fantasy. When I shared this goal with my king, Artaxerxes, you know, he saw it as a good thing to do. And so he gave, he gave his approval, not only his approval, but look at the credit card that he gave me and the entourage of people that came along with me. You know that this has the backing of Wall Street. You know, This has the backing of a major enterprise. So again, uh, the idea, this is not some idle dream. This is a clear-cut goal. It's important for us to realize that if you know where you're going, People are motivated. You ever, you, ever, uh, you know, you ever have a wife where you get lost? You ever have a, you ever get lost and your wife is next to you? And sometimes they lose their submission, submissive spirit, don't they? <laughs> you know, you better pull over because you you know where you're going. And all of a sudden, this loyal helper, supportive partner becomes adversarial because we don't know where we're going. We might insist, I know where I'm going, and by the 15th hour, around the same block, you know you're lost. You see that, that happens, you know, happens with your spouse when somehow we lose our way. Same thing with people. If you know what the goal is, then you can motivate people because having a clear-cut goal is a great motivator. People want to know. They want to know where you're going. And once they know that you're going someplace and you have a clear-cut goal, they're going to be right behind you. They're going to step right in and help you accomplish the goal. That's why you cannot be a fuzzy thinker. You cannot be fuzzy. 
You cannot be an idle dreamer. You cannot be pie in the sky by and by. You've got to have your feet down and know exactly what you're going to be accomplishing. And if that be the case, you know, people of our, our board, executive board always ask me, well, Pastor, what's, uh, what's the vision for the next five years? They ask me. And I need to have a vision for the next five years. Otherwise, they won't be motivated, you know, to do something great. Uh, again, and, and, and clear cut, what is it exactly that you want us to, that you feel that you want archers to accomplish? And that really motivates us. Number three, Nehemiah enlisted the help of the entire city. The whole idea then in motivation is to get down to, to, um, to have the people of God, to have the people of God own the project. They had to own the project. He said, one thing's for you to own it, but it's a whole different ballgame to get them to own it. And you don't want to advance, you don't want to ever, ever advance unless you have people owning the project. Don't ever advance unless you have people owning the project. Nehemiah made the building of the wall their project. So the idea is to get the vision from your heart into, guess what, into their hearts. Okay, that's the idea. To get the vision from you into them. Otherwise, it's pretty difficult to... And here's our mistake, gentlemen, is sometimes we have these great ideas... We know we're right. We want to launch it without their support, without making it their project, and you're doomed to fail. It's like charging a hill, and when you, when you look back, nobody else is charging. You're dead. All the machine guns are focused on you. Okay? But if, if you have 10,000 troops charging the hill, all the machine guns are focused on other people, but if you're the only, you know, lone ranger out there, even Tonto forsakes you, we got some problems. Uh, so again, for that reason, you need to be patient, you need to be patient to make sure that we are enlisting them, motivating them, making it their issue, and that takes a great degree of wisdom. Um, and so what can we do in relation to that? Uh, Nehemiah begins by using the um, cohortative, okay, not the I, not the ego, ego building words but the uh, uh, wall building words the ego building words are always I and me but the wall building words are always let us it's the we let us do it those are the ball, the wall building words that's why you notice in verse uh, 17 of chapter 2 after he tells him what um, what brought him there come let us let us build, rebuild the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. You know, let us. You need to include that. May I, may I make a note there someplace that as you lead people in the direction that you know they need to go, that unless they're with you, you dare not make any moves in that direction. Just, you know, bide your time. When we first introduced our Awana program at our church, I know it was, it was a great program, the Awana program, way, you know, 20 almost 30 years ago when it was on the scene, great program, and I told our children's pastor, I said, you know, we should have this. And they met together, and they decided no. They said, no, this stuff won't work. The barrio kids are not gonna wear uniforms. You know, they're not gonna, they're not gonna come out here on a Wednesday night with uniforms. They're not gonna play these games. They're not gonna memorize these verses. It's too expensive. They're not gonna pay their dues. It's not gonna work. I left it there. Because again, if I wasn't about to teach the stuff, so unless they're with it, I'm not going to do it. So why charge the hill by myself? So we left it there, and I kept the vision, and I said, okay, no problem. Uh, and then about a couple of years later, they went to an Awana Olympics just to observe. They came back all excited. They said, you know, Pastor, we need to have Awana. It does work. You know, this thing is, is going to work. We can make it work. And I said, well, great. Well, let's do it. And so they launched it. Now it was their project, not my project. They had to wait until they took ownership of this. And it took off. I mean, from day one, it just parents bought into it, kids bought into it. Uh, we've been flying ever since. But it's, all, it's been their ministry, their thing. And so it goes with anything, everything. You want to go from congregational rule to elder rule, unless they buy it, you're dead. You know, you're not going to make it. Any, any, any project that you want to accomplish, it's always the issue of we need to make it our project. 
Okay. So again, it's the idea of appealing to them. We need to do it. Let's do it. And, and until they say, like, look at verse 18. And verse 18. And, and until, until they say, in verse 18, until they say, uh, then, then they said, let us arise and build. So he said, he appealed to them in verse 17, but it wasn't until they said with a response, yeah, let us do it. Let's arise and build. Then you're ready to start. But unless you get there, yeah, you know, it's not going to happen. Um, and then secondly, in enlisting the help of, of the entire city, it's the, it's the actual idea of just simply enlisting them and saying, okay, let's get committed. Let's do it then. Let's sign the dotted line. You know, let's commit ourselves to that. And uh, so we, we get them enlisted. And then chapter 3, which the whole of chapter 3, it's an interesting chapter. Chapter 3, if you read it just to read it, to read through the Bible or quiet time, it doesn't say a whole lot. But if you stand back and read it from the perspective of leadership, what you find actually is an organized project. This uh, building of the wall was an organized project. And the key word, the key words in chapter 3 are next to them. Are next to them. What you find in the whole building of the wall is that everybody was assigned a section of the wall to complete. So we took the entire city and those who were willing to work, willing to put their hands to the plow, you might say, uh, and then they were all assigned a section of the wall. And you can actually see the whole wall going up in, in, in pieces because everybody had a section of the wall assigned to them, next to him, next to him. And this is the key, the delegation of responsibilities, and then enlisting them to help, assign a place to them. And as Peter Drucker tells us, the chief object of leadership is the creation of a human community held together by the work bond for a common purpose. We're all working together. Working together to accomplish it's like a, it's like a foot, a good football team where every man has his own part to play. Man, great motivation. We all have are assigned, are assigned places to minister. Uh, again, this is the, this is what motivates people, is the idea of enlisting the help for the entire city becomes their project. When people talk about our church, okay, our church, or our Awana program, or our Sunday school or our building fund, right, our building project, or our missions program. It's when they use the hour, you know they're into it. But when they start talking like the pastor's project or the pastor's philosophy hmm? or the pastor's desire, we got a problem because they haven't taken ownership yet. You know, or your, your vision or your dream for the church, we got a problem there. When it's our dream, it's our project, then, it, then you know something's happened here. So the idea, if you want to motivate people, is to you know, enlist, enlist them, get them involved, get, make it, have it become their project. You that are parents, you know what I'm talking about. You know, um, uh, you know my wife has her grandkids, and you know, she, she sings a little song, clean up, clean up, everybody clean up. Anybody hear that? Yeah, you, you know about it. You know, that's the way you get the kids involved in making it their project. All right, let's clean up this room, okay? All right, clean up, clean up, everybody. And they all start walking around cleaning the, you know, cleaning the stuff up. It works, you know, it's, psycho, it's psychology, but it works on them, you know. The, the whole idea is make it, this is our room, let's make it our project. And so they're motivated to do that. And so that's the idea here. So again, keep that in mind, and Nehemiah was able to do that, so that when you go to chapter 3, what you find is not Nehemiah by himself, he and his, you know, a few cohorts trying to build the wall. You got this whole army of, uh, you know, it's like ants crawling all over this wall. Everyone doing their part in the rebuilding of the wall. Look at number 4. Nehemiah instilled in the people self-motivation self-motivation, he instilled in them self-motivation. Important for us to know as leaders that people always do things because they want to do them. They always do things because they want to do them. And so the key then is to get people to want to do things. Instill in them the motivation as to why they want 
to do. You, when you move, when folks are doing something against their will, it's going to they're going to stop doing it. Eventually, as soon as you leave, they stop doing it. You've, you've been there in a job. When the foreman leaves, everybody stops. Remember you've been there? So the foreman's there cracking the whip. We're all working. And then as soon as he's gone, all right, guys, copy break. Forget it. You know, we all stop working because it's not in us. But if you're self-motivated and you do it, the foreman leaves, hey, you know, you're still doing it. Why? Because you're motivated. You have to get that, that self Self motivation. So Nehemiah was was able able to tap into the self motivation aspects of the people, and he did so by just taking some very noble, noble and basic human instincts that all of us have within us. The thing, the same things that keep us here in seminary, the same thing that got us through life, are the things that are going to motivate people to do things. Notice some of these. First of all, self respect. Self-respect, great, motiva great motivator. It is probably toward the top. What motivates, motivates even us to die is the whole issue of, the issue of dignity, human dignity, your self-worth, your self-respect, what you're made out of. That's why in chapter 2, verse 17, did you catch it? In 2, verse 17, uh, when he said to them, you see the bad situation we're in, uh, that Jerusalem is desolate, its gates are burned by fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no longer be a, what's the word there? Speak to me. A reproach. You know, it's the coach at halftime saying, you know, fellows, this is embarrassing. And we're losing by 20 points. Aren't you embarrassed that the second-rate team is thrashing you? It's taking your carcasses across the f football field and mopping it green. What are you going to do about it? See, see, the whole issue, it's the issue of self-respect. And, and that is a great motivator. How many of us have been motivated in the, after we thought we'd do well in examination and you got your paper back and you felt a sense of embarrassment, right? And you went back and you... You reapplied yourself because you realized that that was not you. This is not the way you function. You don't function at this level. You function at a higher level. And this low grade really, you know, was a kick in the behind to just awaken you, to say, this is not you. And this is what he's saying to these people. You know, this is not us. We're the people of God. I mean, our God reigns. And look at us. This broken down wall is a insult to our God and to us. Again, this is where if you talk about dignity and, and self-respect becomes a great motivator. Notice also number two, the view of the glory of God. The wall is what God wants done. That's what Nehemiah is saying to them. This is what the Lord has for us, the glory of God. Obvious, this is obvious toward the top. It should be first, but in the order of exposition, it's, it's verse 18 and then verse 20. This is what God would like us to do. You know, the God of heaven will give us success. This is the Lord's plan, and the Lord wants this thing accomplished. God's going to be glorified. And so the glory of God becomes a major motivator. Major motivator. I suppose all of us in this room, maybe without exception, we are, we are motivated by the glory of God. We'll go down in flames for the glory of God. Though we never get anything done, if we know it's for the glory of God, we'll go down in flames. Because we know that that is a chief motivator in our own hearts. Okay? And you know what? The people of God are also going to feel the same way. It's not just the ministers that feel the same way, but if we instill this in the hearts of people, they begin to feel the same way. It's for the glory of God. You know, it's for the glory of God. And when, you, when people get to that level, then you know that they are going to be on their own, uh, accomplishing whatever needs to be accomplished because of the glory of God. And Nehemiah was able to remind him of the issue of the glory of God. Number three also is the matter of self-preservation. We also have the word remuneration. What do I get? You know, what's in it for me is the answer. What's in it for me? And unless you show them what's in it for them, most people are not going to be 
motivated to do anything. How do I benefit from this issue? How do I personally benefit from this? In verse 17 of chapter 2, it should be 217, not 317. In 217, it's the whole, whole idea, you see the bad situation we are in. This is not good for us. Matter of fact, this is very dangerous for us. What's the purpose of walls? Keep the good stuff in, the bad stuff out. Yeah, keep the good stuff in, the bad stuff out. This is bad for us. This is bad. No walls means we're all vulnerable. Your children are vulnerable. Your wives are all vulnerable. You are vulnerable. We are in a bad situation. This is not in your best interest for us to allow the walls to be desolate. Let's, uh, let's jump on this thing. Let's get the walls completed. It is for your best interest. This is for the safety of yourself, your wives, your children, etc. So again, a vested interest in this. And always it's the connection of this. What's in it for me, Pastor? Why should we? Why should I do this? So as you, as you talk, as you share, as you preach, and as you, you encourage the saints, you are brought back to this issue of, you know, what's in it for me? And you remind them of that. This is for your benefit. You're not doing it for me. You're doing it for your benefit or for etc. Again, so it's, but remuneration, uh, sometimes it's money. You, you hire people and you need to pay them well, take care of them well, and they will be motivated to work for you. Uh, uh, don't, don't take care of your staff. You know, don't treat them well, don't pay them well, and they won't be motivated. You know, hey, I only get, I only get, you know, change. Why should I, why should I do that? Uh, it's amazing. When you, uh, when you visit, um, when I visited Russia in the early, early days when the wall came down, I was, yeah, I was really impressed with the, what motivates people. I mean, there's no motivation in the Russian people there. I mean, the, the, outside the church. I can recall going to a, you know, going, even just crossing, just crossing the line, you know, just going through customs. I mean, I had nobody, come to America, people meet you, you know, the people that are waiting for you, guiding you. I recall going to the customs and looking around and people were just standing there, like, all the Russians just standing. And I didn't know what to do and I couldn't read Russian and I just saw a green light and I just walked through. I walked through and I waved at you know, I just waved to one of the guys. He looked at me, and I waved at him, and I just kept going through. And that's how I, that's how I got into Russia, in <laughs> Moscow. Yeah. <laughs> on the way out, on the way out, the, my, my Russian uh, Russian guy said, you know, so do you have your papers, uh, the entry papers that you got in? I said, I didn't get any papers when I walked in. <laughs> he said, you didn't? I said, no. Well, you know, you can't get out with those papers. I said, I didn't get anything when I walked in. Well, how did you get in? I said, I just walked through. <laughs> He says, they let you in. I said, yeah. I just went and waved and I walked through. Again, because, I mean, nobody moves. I can recall going to a restaurant and standing there at the, at, the, at the counter waiting for someone to come and sit us, and nobody did. We waited and waited. And then we're just, just lalagagging, just talking. Why? Because, you know, you get paid little whether you do a lot or you do a little. See? It's a communist system, so why put yourself out? Why put yourself out? I recall going on Aeroflot, the airplane. I mean, the, the pilot goes in, the stewardess go in, and then you go in. They don't care if you fly or not. You know, they're, they're in, they get in, and they, and they come out, the pilot comes out. You know, when we fly, the pilot's the last guy out. In this case, the pilot's out first, he's gone, and then, then you're out. I mean, they could care less if you fly or you don't fly. That was bad. But the, that again, is the, the motivation. There's no proper remuneration, and so why should I get myself motivated to give more if I won't get more? And see, this is what, this is what our system creates in, in our society. You know, capitalism does that. It does provide this inner motivation that you can, and some other cultures don't understand that. But it's the idea then, what's in it for me? You want to tap into that. Remind the people, if you want them in Sunday school, What's in it for them? You see, if you want them in, involved in certain things, here's how you gain, how you benefit from this. And Nehemiah was able to do that. Number five, number five, again, interesting. Interesting as you read through the, through the text, in chapter three especially, this long list that seems to be just a long list of people that are working. What you find here, Nehemiah showing us his way of leading. You can motivate people by showing 
appreciation for their work. Show them that you notice what they're doing. And then show them that you appreciate the things that they're doing. When you recognize people's work, it is a great, great motivator. Reading this just a few minutes ago of Susanna Wesley's raising of her, what is it, 19 children? Um, I think she had 16 or 17 rules she lived by. Here's one of them. Never let a good deed, good deed go unrecorded or unnoticed. Never let a good deed go unnoticed or unrecorded. I want to encourage good behavior by recognizing good behavior and showing appreciation for that. And so the issue of uh, leadership is learning to show great appreciation. You see, a bad leader, just people working, he never, never sees them. He never notices them, never goes out of his way to show appreciation for what they're doing. Eventually, his machinery grinds to a halt. Now in a secular field, you just give more money. See, you give more bonuses and more, raise, more raises and that somehow you can keep folks motivated a little longer. But in the nonprofit organization, nonprofit, here is big time stuff. In a nonprofit, which includes our churches, this is very important to recognize just appreciation. Now you'll notice it, and I just made three or four, three observations here. Number one, recorded their names recorded their names. Imagine having your name inscribed in a book read around the world. By the way, you know what the most important word in the English language is? What is the most important word in the English language? What is it? Who said it? Your name. Your name is the most important word in the English, English and in any language. It's your name. You know, when you graduate a few and a few, in, you know, when you graduate in a few weeks, a few, the only name that matters is your name. You know, it's, that's why names are so important. And when you give recognition, so when Nehemiah recorded these names, you know, it's important. It's great motivation. That's why, uh, you know, you, you see that everywhere. And your name is so important. That's why they name, so they name, they name things after people, you know. Pews, you've seen pews with names on them, haven't you? Why do they do that? Because that's what motivates folks to give. Yeah, we'll put your name on it. Yeah, yeah, give me $40,000 for a pew. Put your name on it. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's only worth 500 bucks. You pay 40000 40500 for the pew, three three thirty five thousand for your name. See, it's important that we recognize people. Number two, notice the uh, recorded their accomplishments, what they had done. As you read through the list, you begin to see that they next to them they built, they built, they, somebody built, somebody built the built the fish gate, somebody built this part of the wall. Somebody built a tower, you know, they were a part of a particular, recorded what they actually got accomplished. And number three also, how they did it. Just a few little verses here of how, what it cost them, how they accomplished it and what they did. In other words, the wall, chapter three is a major chapter in showing that Nehemiah was concerned about the motivation of people and he did it by recognizing and just showing deep appreciation for the work that God, that they did for God. The idea of thanking people, thanking people. Man, it took me a long time to learn this thing, how important that is, just to be thanking people, to sit down on a regular basis and just thank people, thanking them for what they did. You know, thanking your Sunday school teachers, thanking anybody who does anything for church to thank them. Show deep appreciation. And that becomes, becomes part, of your, part of your nature when you do that. I just remember uh, years ago I went to a conference and uh, there was uh, this, deep, this golf game resulted in a big study, like 30,000 sample study. And uh, they polled employers and they employed, uh, polled the uh, workers. Employers that they were asked to 
asked here is what motivates people? What motivates your employees? And the employer has always said salary at the very top. And they put recognition and appreciation down around seven. And in every case, the recognition and appreciation is at the top for the employee. Yeah, sort of top. Salary down, down low. Toward the top. So just take note of that because you need to become a person that is able to show a deep appreciation for your people. Everybody. So learn to do that as you, as you get into ministry. Even now, you know, when you walk by an usher, when you walk by a children's director, watch by a parking lot attendant, just go by and say bye, you know, thank you. Thank you. Um, just, this, just this morning, the news coming in, they were saying we are a, very, we have a difficult time recruiting police officers for the, uh, and, and, and deputy sheriffs. Why? Because nobody appreciates them. You know, when was the last time you just went across the cross, you know, when they're having a lunch or a cup of coffee at a Winchell's or whatever, just go and say, hey, by the way, buddy, I just want to tell you that we appreciate what you do in our city. You know, because it never happens. And they need, they need that. All of us thrive. It's toward the top. Uh, so get into the habit of doing that from the pulpit, etc. It's important for you to do that. Okay? And then number six, through modeling through modeling. You motivate through modeling. Chapter 4 is an example of motivation through modeling. You know, mark that one down and nothing motivates more than saying, follow me. When, when you give the example of how things should be done, they, people are going to follow you. They, they're going to be there, follow your example. They, you model faith, you model courage, you model sacrifice, you model all these things and they got right behind him. They, they also they also took faith. They overcame discouragements. They also took courage, overcame fear. They also got involved in sacrificing. And all of that motivated the people. Follow me. So you can't, you can't be a motivator if you're not saying, do what I do. If you're not saying, do what I do by your life, you're not going to motivate people by that. But if you say, do what I do, then you're going to be able to motivate people. You don't always tell people what they need to do. You show them what they need to do. And that becomes for them a, a great, great motivator. And then number seven, Nehemiah motivated through integrity. People will follow someone they what? They trust. Listen, fellows, if people can't trust you, forget about being a leader. You're dead. The minute they find you out, you're on your own. But if they can trust you, they're going to go to the end of the earth for you. And so he earned their trust, and he maintained their trust. He earned their trust and maintained. Once you've earned people's trust, fellows, don't ever lose that. Don't ever lose that, because that becomes a great, great motivating factor. He wasn't self-serving. He had a sacrificial spirit. He was very, very loyal to the end. So again, the integrity is a big way by which we're able to motivate people's lives. They find who you are, they learn to trust you, and then they're willing to follow you. They're willing to follow you in whatever you do. Again, your job is going to be to motivate people. And by the way, it's not just like once every three months or like once a month, it's like all the time. You know, every, all the time, it's just a matter of learning to do that. Uh, may I encourage you now to get in the habit of doing that? Just be, just be indiscriminate. Be indiscriminate in this issue of motivating. Okay, any place you go, any place you go, if you go to the restaurant, some waitress is there, you know, thank her. Some guy painting stuff and say, you know what? That's you're doing a great job. You know, just just get into that habit. Man, if there's one thing you don't want to be stingy is, is with your praises. Okay? You can be stingy with your lousy bucks, you know, but do not be stingy with your praises. And for most of us, we are most greedy and stingy with these kinds of things. Okay? That's one thing you can afford to just give and give and give and give because you have so many places to give it. Just learn to do that. Try it this week. Go by the nursery. Go by the nursery and just tell, you know, hey... Ladies, just want to thank you for taking care of my kids. Appreciate you. I know it's tough sometimes to take my little kids and watch them. But I really appreciate that very much. 
you know, just, just do that. Go out of your way. You park your car here, drive, you know, walk those 20 steps to the parking lot attendant and say, you know what, brother, so-and-so, I want to thank you for watching my auto bill. I know it's a job you do, and it's, I want to th thank you. I appreciate God. I thank God for you. Yeah, that, you've made his day. You made his day. You know, you put a bounce in his step. Don't be stingy with your okay, appreciation of people. Okay? We'll see you next week.